the reading of his word. Doesn't he? There's never a time when you can read it and not be blessed, unless, of course, you intend not to be blessed. In which case, read it again. Pastor Al already asked you for the first favor, the second one. Will you please pray for me as I speak? And in your prayer, just ask God to put his words in my mouth. Jeremiah 1.9, God says, I have touched your lips. And that's what I want. I want God to touch my lips so that I can speak his word clearly and effectively. And the last favor is to ask you to think. Because God gave you a brain and he said, come now, let us reason together, my people. So I want you to think. Are you comfortable? Not for long. The virgins are sleeping and they need to wake up. The church must wake up and get ready to meet the bridegroom, must she not? And that is illustrated by our story today. It was a triumphant scene. The same type of animal who bore his mother to Bethlehem now bore him. With slow, measured, careful steps, plodding down the slope of the Mount of Olives. Indeed, the king was on his way. The beautiful holy city lay spread out before them, marble gleaming and gold glowing in the lowering sun, what a sight it must have been. What a sense of pride and joy must have risen in the hearts of the people as they thought of the coming glory. And then, in the midst of the celebration, they heard someone weeping. Why, who could cry on such an occasion? It was Jesus the king whom they adored. He got down off of the donkey, went to the brow of the hill, overlooking the beloved city. And he cried. But his was no ordinary grief when the king of kings cried. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes, for the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Imagine being on the brink of disaster. If only we had known, but we did. And I have to ask, is there a t-shirt for that? If only we had known. They didn't know that their golden opportunity was fading. Fitting then that the sun was setting on the city. The light fades gradually until there's none left. Walk in the light, Jesus says while you have the light. For the night is coming when no man can work. And he could see the darkness falling even in that glorious moment. But the people saw only the glory. They believed it would continue forever. 
that the favor of God would rest on them despite their rejection of Christ. How terrible then to be blind to the one thing, that good thing, that would ensure eternal life. Because He is the light, and He is the life. And the life was the light of men. And He was getting ready to leave. If only thou hadst known. The Bible is full of counsel for those who don't know. Dads and moms, you remember when Jesus was a boy of 12? In Luke chapter 2, verse 49, when they finally found him in the temple again after three days, he said, Wist ye not? Didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? And then, after his resurrection, he walked as a stranger among men, as he had during his life. He joined up with two disciples on their way to Emmaus. They didn't know they were walking with Jesus. If only they had known. Their eyes were holden, the Bible says. But later, when their eyes were opened, they knew Him. If thou hadst known, even thou in this thy day. Revelation 3, verse 17, Jesus talking to His church in the end days says, you don't even know your own condition. You know, it's not optimal to be blind. There are some blind people, they function very well. But to not know, do you know anyone who's blind? Do you know anybody who's blind but doesn't know that they are blind? Jesus says, you don't even know, and that's the problem. He says, if only you had known, at least in this thy day. By the way, we are experts at diagnosing other people's conditions. Physician, heal thyself. We all know, or do we all know, Hosea 4, verse 6? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. What knowledge is that, pray tell? John 17, 3, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And God says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You know, when Jesus was on earth, he was the subject of many arguments. He was involved in some of them, but some people were arguing among themselves as to who he was and where he came from. You remember any of those conversations and that are recorded in the Bible about how people were talking about him? For instance, in John chapter 7, when he went to the feast, and uh, he said some great truths from God's Word, and they started arguing among themselves about who he was. Remember? John chapter 7, I read from verses 27 to 29. And they said, How be it, we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. If only you had known. We know where he's from. Where is he from? Nazareth. Nothing good ever comes from Nazareth. But the Bible says that he's supposed to come from Bethlehem. And so they argued among themselves. But they said, nobody knows where he came from. 
And Jesus said in the temple as he taught, saying, you both know me and you know whence I am. You know me and you know where I came from. I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom you know not. Someone they claimed to know was the Heavenly Father sent his own Son, and the one they claimed to know they didn't know. Because his Son, who revealed the Father most fully, they rejected. So they didn't know. He said, you know, you know me and you know whence I am. You know where I'm from. I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom you know not. But I know him, for I am from him and he has sent me. Now I can imagine Jesus as he paused on the brow of the hill overlooking that lovely scene. Having a conversation with his father, albeit a very short one. And it would go... In my imagination, something like this. Jesus saying, Daddy. And the Father says, Yes, Son. Jesus says, I know what's going to happen to me, but that doesn't concern me as much as what's going to happen to all these people. And the Father said, Son, you have done what you can. And those who will, will follow you. Hosea 13, verse 9 says, O Israel, you have destroyed yourself. In their hatred and cruelty toward the disciples of Jesus, the people rejected their last offer of mercy. They were chaining themselves to the devil by not accepting Jesus. And Jesus saw all of that from the Mount of Olives. Now, which would you say is worse, the coming disaster or denying its approach? What good is knowing and not being ready? Jesus is coming soon. Are we prepared to meet him? It would be tragic to know and not be ready, would it not? To refuse his counsel and not prepare. Have you ever had to prepare for anything? Who here has ever gone to school? When you have an exam, you learn and you study. Right? Did you see us? When you have a foot race, if you ever had to do that, you train and you practice. When you have a work project, you gather all the needed information, procedures, and resources. What do you do to prepare to meet Jesus? If only you had known what you needed to prepare to meet Jesus. How about learning to obey and to trust Him? Has He ever said anything to you in His Word? Has He? Did you obey and trust it? Did you learn how to obey and trust through obeying and trusting His Word? Did you? When you do that, you receive more capacity to do the same. When he said, you know, all the great things that he did, he said, you will see greater things than these. Because people like us who have not seen him in person and yet believe, that is faith. We can obey and trust him not having seen him. Is that not correct? Sure it is. But those people, they saw him and they thought they knew him. We know his father and mother. We know where he came from. He was a little boy in Nazareth. Some people might have remembered him from his youth. And yet, they did not learn to obey and trust him, as they could have. And another thing you could do to prepare to meet Jesus is to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. 
Now, wouldn't he like to see that in you and me? Hmm? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. If only we had known what we needed to prepare. Hey, when you're going to go on a trip with your car, you put gas in it. Or if it's a diesel, you put that in it. <laughs> That's another story. Cultivating the fruit of the Spirit. Second Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 1. I like getting the whole picture of things. You know, you can get a lot of truth in just a few words. But I like to surround it with what the apostle was thinking when he wrote this. And you see what I mean. Second Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 1. I'll read through to verse 9. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Ed Teal, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Boy Hall, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Bob Cooper, Marge Cooper, and whoever else. A servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, if only you had known. According as his divine power hath given us all things, how many? All things that pertain unto life and godliness. What kind of life? Eternal life and godliness. Godliness. That would be God seeing his picture reflected in your life. Aha, now we're thinking, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. There's that word again, knowledge, if only we had known. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, if only we had known, if only we had read them, if only we had believed and trusted and abide by them. We might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now what was happening on the brow of that hill is that Jesus was surrounded by a group of people, a multitude of people that were going to crown him king when he got into Jerusalem. And rightfully, he was the king. But he was not the king they thought he was. He was the king that came to help them be partakers of the divine nature, not the one who was going to give them swords and physical strength to overcome their physical oppressors. That wasn't his case. They, he did not intend to liberate them from their political opponents. He intended to have them escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. And so the Apostle Peter continues, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, if only you had known, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to God, uh, brotherly kindness charity, love. For if these things be in you and abound, they shall make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If only we had known. If we had known, we wouldn't be walking down the hill with him expecting to proclaim him king over a kingdom he never claimed. Deep breath. But he says, but the he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Have we forgotten? And what do you do when you forget? Remember. Revelation 2, verse 5, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, 
and do the first works or else. I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. Remember. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation, Romans 8 verse 1. Remember, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus and who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Now do you suppose that the people that went down the hill with Jesus were walking after the flesh or after the Spirit? What kind of kingdom was Jesus bringing about? A spiritual kingdom, which means in your heart and in your mind and in the Spirit which God gave you when you became alive, He always intended for that to be a spiritual matter. Now, in the care of the physical bodies that he gave us, he intends for us to care for them so that the truth that he intends for us spiritually will be understood and assimilated and obeyed. Is that all right with you? Good. Walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Understand what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. Uh, I'm, super, I'm sure some people wish that the Holy Spirit would make them millionaires. I'm a millionaire. I have breathed over a million times. I'm a billionaire. My heart has beat billions of times. I am rich. But I'm not increased with goods. And I am not in need of nothing. I am in need of everything that God wants to make available to me. Are you rich in God? I hope so. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16, he says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we're walking down the hill with Jesus and we want to make him king because we don't like the guys that are ruling over us, he says, walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill that lust. Verse 17, For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit lusteth against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other. Now, some people think you can marry the two and have them live together. And you can have it both ways and still go to, go to heaven. That is not the case. The Bible speaks against that. Why? Because it says so right here. These two are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, some people take that statement and say the law has been done away with. Do you believe that for a microsecond? Does the Holy Spirit ever lead someone to break the law? No. Good morning, brother. You are not under the condemnation of the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Now in a minute I'll be talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Notice it's not fruits, but fruit. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. We'll call this the fruit of the devil. Adultery, fornication, okay, all the things that nobody wants to talk about, but which happen anyway. Uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murder, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Unfortunately, the people of God mistakenly believe that they shall inherit the kingdom of God while enjoying this fruit. 
But they, like Adam and Eve, are wrong. <clears throat> Against such things there is a law. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. That's what Jesus was trying to get into the heads and hearts of people who were walking with him. Even on that day. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh. And at, the point, at this point in the story, it was going to be about five or six more days and Jesus would be crucified. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. I really want to get out of this situation. I really want to be in another situation. That may be a lust of the flesh. But Jesus says, you crucify that with the affections and the lusts. And he goes on to say, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You live by it. You order your life after it. Your lifestyle, everything that is about you is according to the Holy Spirit. And so he says, let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So if you're walking down the hill with Jesus on the way to his coronation or supposed coronation in Jerusalem that day, you're thinking that He's going to take the throne and give you everything you ever wanted in this world. And you would be mistaken, just as mistaken as we are today, thinking the same thing. So with this in mind, why do we want Jesus to be the king of our lives? Is it because he's going to give us everything we want? Is he going to fulfill our every wish? Uh -uh. Hmm. Why do we even study our Bibles today? And why do we even sing the songs that we sing? And are we among the multitude who praised Him coming down the hill, but a few days later would be the ones who railed on Him on the way back up the hill to be crucified at Calvary? Were they cheering Him on to make themselves feel good? Or because Jesus is really worth it? And he said, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. At least in this thy day. What is this thy day? 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. This thy day. And even though you know what is coming, do we know what's coming? He says, even though you know what's coming, you can be at peace. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Jesus said, the things which belong unto thy peace. God gives peace which nobody understands. And if you have that peace, people will not understand. Isaiah says, verse, chapter 27, verse 5, Let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me. And he shall make peace with me. What do you consider taking hold of his strength? There's a story in the Bible of someone who took hold of his strength and made peace with God on a night of wrestling. Genesis 32, verse 29. Jacob wrestled with this person all night long. He took hold of his strength and he did not know who he was wrestling with until the day broke. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, 
Wherefore is it that thou dost ask my name? And Jacob, and he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And Jacob was at peace with God. Therefore, being justified by faith, Romans 5 verse 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the things which belong unto our peace, Jesus describes. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. He is our peace. If we don't have him, we don't have peace. If you have him, you have peace. And by the way, if you have him, you have everything he has. There are things which belong to our peace, which we are concerned all of us, to know and understand the way how peace is made. The offers made of peace, the offer that God makes to you to give you His peace, the terms on which we may have the benefit of peace, the things which belong to our peace are those things that relate to our present and future welfare. When you make peace with God, you secure your own spiritual and eternal welfare. This again from the commentator Matthew Henry of yesteryear. He said, It is the amazing folly of multitudes that enjoy the means of grace, and it would be a fatal consequence to them if that they do not improve the day of their opportunities. Remember, if thou hadst known even thou in this thy day, they had an opportunity. The things of their peace are revealed to them, but they are not minded or regarded by them. They hide their eyes from them as if they were not worth of talking or taking notice of. They are not aware of the accepted time and the day of salvation and let it slip and perish through mere carelessness. Now listen to this. None are so blind as those that will not see. nor have any the things of their peace more certainly hidden from their eyes than those that turn their backs on them. Now, is it okay with you if I show you a little object lesson? I can't see you. Why? Because I've turned my back on you. I can't see what I'm not looking at. Jesus says many times, Behold. What things belong to our peace? How do we obtain peace? Go back to Romans 5 verse 1. We have peace when we are justified. Being justified is being declared righteous by our holy God. Under what condition does he do that? And are we there yet? If not, how do we get there? How do we get back to the place we have fallen from? Well, let's ask Jesus. Revelation 2 verses 4 and 5. I read it before this morning. Nevertheless, he says, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Candlesticks give light. Lamps give light. The light comes from the oil in the lamp. All the virgins were sleeping. That means the whole church 
was sleeping. People sleep when they're tired and when they're comfortable. So I ask again, are you comfortable? Not for long. And the bridegroom stepped, stopped on the brow of the hill to look at his bride and he wept, not for himself, but for her. The thought of his own agony did not intimidate that noble, self-sacrificing soul. It was the sight of Jerusalem that pierced the heart of Jesus. Jerusalem that had rejected the Son of God and scorned his love that refused to be convinced by his mighty miracles and was about to take his life. He saw what she was in her guilt of rejecting her Redeemer and what she might have been had she accepted him who alone could heal her wound. He had come to save her. How could he give her up? Desire of Ages, page 576, paragraph 1. How could he give her up? Adam died because of Eve. How could he give her up? Jesus died for his church. He could not give her up. If Jerusalem had known what it was her privilege to know, and had heeded the light which heaven had sent her, have we had lots of light sent to us? If she might have stood forth in the pride of prosperity, the queen of kingdoms, free in the strength of her God-given power. Has God given this church power? Unlimited. But what did we do with it? We let it go. Didn't we? We let it go. We saw signs on the door of the church. You can't go in. And we were okay with that. We read things in emails and official statements of churches that said we're okay with what is going on in the world today. We're okay with it. And churches shut down and people were okay with staying home in their pajamas watching somebody else go to church somewhere. Personally, I'm not going to speak for any of you. Personally, I'm not okay with that. And if I could speak to God, and I think I am in this moment, neither is He. He has lost none of His power over the ages to heal and to sustain. He has lost none of it. He has an unlimited supply. And even after he's used it all, he has more. That's something we can't fathom. So when a bug comes along, God says, I can protect you from that. We refused to believe him. And I would say to all you scientists out there, you don't have it all. But God does. And he speaks for me, not anybody else. Now we know what it is our privilege to know. We can't pretend that we don't. We can't pretend that God can't save us anymore. His arm is not shortened that it cannot save. And his ear is not heavy that it cannot hear. Did you hear me? And you all out there that are watching on TV later, you hear me? Hear the Spirit speaking. Free in the strength of her God-given power. But we gave it up. There would have been no armed soldiers standing at her gates. Today, there would have been nobody telling us we couldn't go to church. There wouldn't be anybody checking your ID or registering you when you went into God's house. 
No Roman banners waving from her walls. And there would have been no signs on the church door saying closed because of this or that. Mandate. The glorious destiny that might have blessed Jerusalem had she accepted her Redeemer rose before the Son of God. She, he saw that she might through him have been healed of her grievous malady, liberated from bondage and established as the mighty metropolis of the earth. From her walls the dove of peace would have gone forth to all nations. She would have been the world's diadem of glory. What could have been? What could have been? What could have been? Grievous malady. Did the church have a grievous malady? Most certainly. Did the church in our day have a grievous malady? Is it a grievous malady not to trust God? Let me ask you, do you trust Him? In every aspect of your life. Liberated from bondage? Ooh, do we need to be liberated from bondage? What kind of bondage are we in today? Remember the first sermon that Jesus preached in the synagogue at Nazareth. They all wondered at the gracious words that proceeded out of his lips. And then he said, you need a savior. And then they hated him. Because he said, I came to liberate the captives. That means that we are captives. And we don't like to be called that. We like to believe we're free. <clears throat> Imagine yourself visiting the Apostle Paul in prison. He would tell you he was freer than most people ever would be. Because in Jesus, you are free. You, are, you have liberty. You have that liberty that he gave. Don't give it up. From her walls, the dove of peace would have gone forth to all nations. Did that happen? No. What happened was, people got fired from their jobs, they lost their homes, they lost their lives, they lost their health, because somebody thought they could say something that would kind of go along with the world and yet sort of profess faith in God, but not quite. And she would have been the world's diadem of glory. But instead, not one stone was left upon another that was not thrown down. What could have been, what would have been? Jesus saw it all and he cried. Not tears of ordinary grief. I cannot imagine how God would cry over you or me if we failed or refused to be there when he has made everything available to us to help us to be there. Isn't that right? And he still cries. For the day shall come upon thee, he said, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee. Oh, just tell us the good things, Pastor. Just tell us the good things. Tell us how good we're doing. Tell us all the wonderful things that God is doing. The church is growing. All these people are coming in. It's wonderful, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. For the day shall come upon thee in the setting sun, light glinting off the golden marble of the temple. Thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee around and keep thee in on every side. That's an attack. It's a siege. Is the church under siege today? The search is under siege by a very capable enemy. And they shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not 
leaving thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Now one could only imagine what would have happened if they had known the time of their visitation. Jesus said, For the day shall come upon thee. From that very spot, 39 years later, the Roman general Titus would survey the same scene. His legions besieged Jerusalem, as Jesus had said. And the words of Jesus came true. The city was laid even with the ground. They broke down everything and plowed it under. Not one stone was left upon another with millions of people within her. Not one stone was left upon another because they didn't know. But they could have known, and they should have known. And we could say today, I didn't know. Well, why wouldn't we when we have this? Is it because we don't really believe it? Is it because we, we read it and we can't believe it? I don't understand. I've heard a statistic. It may be better, it may be worse now, but as things tend today, I believe it's probably worse that of all the people, even Seventh-day Adventists, this is Christianity worldwide, or maybe it was just in North America, Christianity in general, including Seventh-day Adventism, of all the people that go to church every Sabbath, one out of six people read their Bible every day. That is not a good statistic. There is a grievous malady. We do need to be liberated from bondage. The bondage that we have imposed on ourselves. There's an old Greek myth. I used to read those when I was in high school. It was one of the required things. And I remember the principle. There was a man who could forge a chain that no one could break. And then they put it on him. Forge me a chain that no one can break. And so he did, and they bound him in his own chains. We have done it to ourselves. And the only way out is to ask Jesus to burst asunder those fetters that bind us, that we have made for ourselves, or that we have willingly accepted from the world. For the things that they have offered to God's people in these days are peace and safety. But you know what happens after that, don't you? Their time of visitation was right then, wasn't it? In Jesus' tireless, selfless ministry for them. And they didn't know because they refused to know. They refused to accept the truth about, one, their own condition, and two, their need of the Savior who walked among them and whom they would soon crucify. God would give them another length of time of Jesus' ministry in years before he brought the judgment on them. How much longer will he give us? We cannot depend on things being as they were or things continuing forever. So are you comfortable? I hope not. A sinner should never be comfortable in church. Or do you realize and accept the reality of your own condition and repent? If you have ever asked God to show you your condition, get ready. He'll show you. It may not be pleasant, but accept it all the same. Because he shows you so that you will repent. And he has repentance as a gift waiting for you to turn around and say, here, take this. The ten virgins in Jesus' parable, they all repented. But for five of them it was too late. And the doomed city was lost because they chained themselves to Satan by not accepting Christ. The one thing that could make them free, they rejected. 
And now the last message of mercy is being given to us. And that pause on the brow of the hill of the Mount of Olives, the last message of mercy given. And Jesus is coming down the hill now. He pauses to gaze upon the beautiful church that is spread before his eyes. How peaceful, how beautiful. But behind the peace and beauty lies something sick that only he can see. So he weeps, the agonizing tears coursing down his cheeks for the fading opportunity that will soon be gone forever. And Jesus mourned, not for himself, but for his people. And the Bible says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. May God help us to realize our true condition. Grant us repentance and to live the way he intended as a witness to this world. Because if we live like them, we are no witness to them. We cannot offer them something we don't have. And if we don't have anything, it's because we have not taken it from God. He offers it to us freely. Do we want it? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we understand from your word that these are perilous times in which we live. The people walking down the Mount of Olives with Jesus that day, they might have understood. They could have understood. With the word of God readily available, they should have understood. And Jesus was preaching it to them all the time. He was trying to make them aware of their true condition and who he was and what he truly came to do for them. Through his word, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit for them, some of them got it. And they praised and worshipped Him. And we today, we are, as a church, generally speaking, so comfortable in this world. A lot of times we, we want to be just like it. But that's not acceptable to you. And neither are we if we live that way. We must trust you. It's not really hard. All we have to do is accept your word. Like the centurion whose servant you healed just by speaking the word. We understand that you framed the whole world just through your word. And it has power because the one who spoke it has power. And it is available to us if we will just align ourselves with you and trust you. You have asked us to do that. But if we don't, you can't help us. We thank you for your word because it tells us about ourselves and it tells us about you. It tells us we fall short of your glory. And it tells us how we may obtain it. If we have the Son, we have life. So let us build on that foundation that you have given us, that is yourself. It shall never fail, because you never fail us. Help us to understand and realize that as we go through the rest of our lives and the short time that we have left here on this earth. We, we are not afraid of what's coming. We just need help to go through it, if that is your will. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. We know you'll still be. 
May our sweetest thoughts be of you. May we love to talk of you. Because we will just continue that in the new kingdom. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.